Welcome to our webinar. Um, I have to apologize up front. I do not have a camera this morning. Uh, for some reason, my camera is not working, so you will only be hearing me. Uh, my name is Misty Bruceri, and I'm the coordinator for the Reach Codes program, which is a part of our statewide codes and standards program. I'm here today with Avni Goyal from TRC. Avni is one of the key analysts on our Reach Codes technical team. And she's going to present the results of the cost effectiveness analysis for non residential new construction under the 2022 code. Um, I just want to let everybody know that we will be recording the session and also we'll be posting the um, presentation as well as the recording online after the webinar. Usually takes us a couple of days to get it posted, but we will let you know. So um, I'm going to get things started off with a brief overview of the REACH Codes program and the high level objectives of the cost effectiveness analysis. Um, once I go through that, I'm going to turn things over to Avni and she's going to provide you with a detailed review of the non-residential analysis methodology, all the assumptions, costs, the rationale and the results that we have so far. Uh, following that, I'll be back and I'll provide a brief summary of the different kinds of ordinance um, of the optional ordinance structures that the uh, that can be supported by the analysis. Okay. Let's uh, go ahead and jump in. Uh, first off, as I said, the Reach Codes program is part of our our statewide codes and standards program, which uh, advocates for more stringent building and appliance standards. Um, provides support for compliance and, as you all know, supports local governments in REACH code adoption and implementation. Um, our primary program objective is to support local governments in the adoption of REACH codes. And one of our main tasks is to um, conduct these cost effectiveness analyses. Uh, we provide a lot of different technical support and resources. Um, uh, including, of course, these studies, but also we provide some draft model ordinance language that you can use as a place uh, basis to start from. Uh, staff report templates, uh, tools such as our cost effectiveness explorer, uh, webinars such as this and our newcomer series. And other general support to uh, local jurisdictions as requested. Um, our webinar is about our cost effectiveness analysis, so I want to just take a moment to note a few things about the analyses. Um, some of you may have heard this before when we talked about the single family results, but um, I think it's important to just note um, kind of what the objectives of the analyses are. Um, the analyses are the main objective, of course, is for us to find a uh, cost effective and non preempted package of measures that can support a REACH code that requires going beyond the minimum state requirements. Um, we do the studies statewide across all 16 climate zones, and they are intended to support a, a wide range of requirements that could be adopted in the state. Um, so we try to take a, a try to really define the, the, the envelope within which um, REACH codes could be adopted. Um, all of our studies, we present cost effectiveness results in, in two different ways. One is on bill, which is kind of the individual's perspective. And the second is time dependent valuation or TDV. That is the same metric as the state code uses, um, and it provides a societal, a societal perspective of the cost effectiveness analysis, including externalities and things like that. Uh, generally, we use pretty conservative assumptions in the studies. Um, trying to acknowledge that there are varying conditions in the state and also it's um, a little bit easier to make things work on paper than it can be in real life sometimes. So we try to keep things conservative to give folks just give you just a little bit of room there. Um, and one thing I just want to make sure that everybody understands, uh, the study has a particular objective and that is to meet these legal requirements. And because of that, we have some constraints. And so the study doesn't is it's not an example of best design practices. Um, we need to use some measures that may or may not be the most common measures or the best design um, in or in the study to meet the legal requirements. So um, just keep that in mind when you look at it. Sometimes the measures are a little bit um, uh, non intuitive. 
And it's also not a list of specific measures that would be required to meet an ordinance. We put together a package and we show what that package contains in the study, but um, the ordinances typically just set a performance requirement and applicants can use whatever compliant measures are available to them to meet the requirements. A quick review of the 2022 code compliance metrics. In the 2022 Title 24 code, um, we've had several changes to these metrics, and especially on the non residential and multifamily side. Um, we still are using time dependent valuation, only now we have three different metrics. Um, the metrics are very similar to the single family metrics, but there isn't an EDR score calculated. Um, so you have to comply with each metric. Uh, you, <clears throat> excuse me. And the first is time dependent valuation. Uh, non residential and multifamily, um, high rise multifamily before, now it's all multifamily, um, had used time dependent valuation as the metric for compliance already. Uh, we used the TDV total at the time, uh, but in 2022 for non-residential, there's now PV and storage required, and so that metric's been split into two components. There's the TDV efficiency, which includes all of the impacts of the different efficiency measures, as well as the TDV total now, which includes efficiency, but also PV and storage. So it's a combination of all the impacts of those. Um, in addition to that, we've added a source energy use metric. And um, that hourly source energy use is actually a proxy for GHG savings and GHG emissions. Um, it, it tends to track very well. And so there's now a third metric that all projects have to meet. And again, you have to meet each one of these individually. OK, um, when you start setting up a, a policy, Typically, we recommend that you set those requirements based on some sort of a compliance margin, not using any absolute values. Um, typically, it's some it's for non resident multifamily a percent below the maximum budget. Um, we are still working on that, but at this point, the uh, focus that we can see is that both efficiency and load flexibility really help with cost effectiveness. And so um, that's likely the metric that we'll be focusing on. Uh, we're still, do, still doing a little bit of analysis, though, to, to make sure that we keep that, um, uh, make sure that we have that down. But uh, definitely be focusing on efficiency and load flexibility measures. Okay. Sorry about that. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Avani and let her go through the uh, details of all the analyses she's been working on. Thank you, Misty. Hi, everyone. My name is Avni Goel from TRC. I'm joined here by my colleague Farhad Faraman, and we'll be presenting the results on uh, reach code cost effectiveness for non residential new construction buildings. Avani, sorry to interrupt you. We, we don't have a presentation up yet. Yeah, let me share my screen. OK, <laughs> sorry. There we go. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Misty, for the good introduction. Uh, we can dive right into the assumptions of our study and the results. Um, just a quick overview. So we have new construction non residential building types. Uh, the scope of the measures include electrification, efficiency, renewables and load flexibility. Um, we are evaluating the cost effectiveness uh, based on two methodologies. One is on bill. Um, the customers, um, how much utility bill savings they get over a life cycle of time. A TDV basis, time dependent valuation, which is the CEC uh, approach. Uh, we are using 15 year as the life cycle for non residential buildings. And the two metrics that we are evaluating cost effectiveness on is net present value, NPV, and benefit to cost ratio, BCR. 
the four prototypes that we are evaluating are medium office, retail, quick service restaurant and small hotel. Uh, we have built this in CBEC 2022 beta software. This is the new software um, released for both multifamily and non-residential. This is still a beta version, though the compliance version is not released yet. A medium office is a three story, five, 50,000 50, square feet building. Uh, each story has like a large core zone and um, four perimeter zones. Sorry, I just saw a comment where uh, the slides are not being seen. I just want to check um, if everyone can see the slides. I can I can still see them. It looks like others can. OK, yeah, I think I think something on your end, Sarah. <laughs> OK, yeah, thanks. Sorry about that. OK, um, moving on. So retail, uh, we have a one story 24,000 square feet building. It has one very large core zone with four small zones. The quick service restaurant is a small fast food service restaurant. And it's a 2500 square feet with two main thermal zones. One is for dining area and another is kitchen. The small hotel is a four story 42,000 square feet with uh, almost 77 guest rooms, a laundry area and some common and non residential spaces. The HVAC system that we have selected for our baseline mixed fuel scenario and all electric scenario is presented here for office and retail. The baseline is based on um, the 2022 prescriptive requirements. Uh, this is a combination of 2019 ACM and our best understanding of what the 2022 ACM system map will look like. So medium office is still the same as 2019 ACM. It's a variable air volume reheat system with packaged rooftop units and VAV hot water reheat boxes um, for each of the thermal zones, which is fed by a gas boiler. This is um, updated to an all electric system with VAV electric resistance boxes instead of hot water reheat. And for medium retail, there has been some updates in 2022 code where um, Systems with certain capacity are already required to be heat pump. So uh, most of the small zones already have single zone heat pump in the baseline, whereas the core zone, which has a capacity between 30 to 40 tons, um, is assumed to have a packaged single zone AC unit plus gas furnace. Um, there are some variations based on climate zone as well. Uh, climate zone 1 and 16, um, they require dual fuel heat pump for a certain um, capacity and for smaller systems, they still use a mixed fuel single zone AC and furnace. Um, the all electric scenario for each of the climate zones and each of the zones, um, both large and small, is single zone heat pump. So for the core zone where we have a big 30 to 40 ton mixed fuel system that is um, updated to two small um, packet single zone heat pump systems in the all electric scenario. Yeah, actually, let me take this question. I just saw a question about why electric resistance versus heat pump. Uh, so it's a good question for medium office. Uh, the more practical system is actually a central heat pump boiler, but uh, because of the modeling limitations, so currently CBEC or CBEC-COM does not have the capability to model um, central heat pump boiler system. Uh, hence, we are using VAV electric resistance boxes as a placeholder for now until we have that capability. Uh, moving on to the restaurant and hotel. Uh, restaurant is um, same as 2019 ACM system. It's a packet single zone system, AC and furnace in the baseline and packet single zone heat pump in the proposed, both for dining and kitchen. For small hotel, uh, the guest rooms are served by packet single zone units and non-residential is served by the system. Similar to medium office, we have a variable air volume hot water reheat system 
whereas the all electric scenario uh, uses single zone heat pump for all the guest rooms and non residential areas have um, VAV electric resistance boxes instead of hot water reheat boxes. Here, um, the electric resistance boxes is actually a more practical system because there are very few non residential areas that would be served by uh, the VAV boxes. So a central heat pump boiler um, may not be very practical. For water heating, uh, medium office and retail have very limited water heating use. So we uh, assume electric resistance point of use water heaters in both baseline and proposed. So there is no electrification update for water heating in the two prototypes. For restaurant and small hotel, uh, we are using heat pump water heaters in the all electric scenario. The quick service restaurant, uh, we are using a unitary heat pump water heater, whereas in small hotel, uh, we are using central heat pump single pass system for all the guest rooms and the laundry has its own um, water heating system and it uses split heat pump water heater. Um, just to um, bring back to our previous analysis in 2019, uh, in the 2019 statewide reach code study, we did not have the capability to model central heat pump uh, system for the small hotel, but um, we had modeled clustered heat pump water heaters because of this modeling limitation, but this go around um, we have updated it to a more practical uh, central heat pump system. Here is a cost breakdown for the oil electric uh, HVAC and water heating system, uh, including any appliances. Uh, we collected these costs from two uh, large mechanical design build contractors. One is based in Bay Area, one is based in Southern California. So uh, we have tried to account for geographical differences um, with different contractors and using different labor cost multipliers. Um, for medium office, we see a net cost savings of almost $7,000. Uh, this is because of the avoided boiler, hot water piping, gas infrastructure. Um, there is some added electric infrastructure costs though, almost $140,000 for any additional panel or electric circuitry to support uh, the electric systems. For medium retail, um, we are assuming cost savings of almost $13,000. Um, this is... Uh, primarily based on the HVAC system. HVAC system, uh, the single zone heat pump and single zone packaged are, uh, they have similar costs. Um, and because of the avoided gas infrastructure, we do see some cost savings overall. For quick service restaurant, um, we are evaluating two different scenarios. Um, one is where we are electrifying HVAC, water heating, and cooking. Um, and the other is uh, where we just electrify HVAC and water heating. So with cooking, the additional incremental cost comes out to be $27,000. But if you are electrifying just HVAC and water heating, there is cost savings of almost $3,000. Um, or we can say that it's like similar. There is not... Um, any additional first cost that uh, we have to worry about. Um, the heat pump water heater specifically drives the electrification cost in the restaurant. The single zone packaged unit costs are similar. So the heat pump water heater cost and the gas infrastructure cost kind of balances out and uh, they have like minimal cost savings as a result. For small hotel, we see high HVAC cost savings, um, but there is an additional incremental cost for heat pump water heater because of um, guest rooms and laundry systems using water heating. Um, so the net cost savings comes out to be almost $300,000. This is a summary of all the packages that we have evaluated. So far, um, we have developed energy efficiency measures based on the list of 25 case measure list. It includes envelope, lighting, HVAC control, among others. Um, 
The list of measures varies by the prototype uh, depending on its applicability. We have introduced load flex flexibility measures as well. This go around uh, for medium office and quick service restaurant. The medium office has um, smart thermostat and demand response lighting as um, added load flexibility measures. Whereas quick service restaurant, um, we've added a heat pump, water heater, load shift, um, where we shift the schedule to do preheating before the peak periods. Um, just a couple of footnotes there. So quick service restaurant, as I mentioned before, we are evaluating two different scenarios with and without cooking. And uh, for small hotel, um, just to reiterate, we are including electrification of uh, laundry, water heating, and clothes dryer. Okay. Um, diving into the packages, um, are there any quick questions regarding the assumptions and the methodology before I go into the results? You, you do have one question in the chat. Uh, why electric from Kelly? Why electric resistance versus heat pump for all electric medium office? Yeah, I think I took that question before. I can reiterate the answer. So the central heat pump boiler would have been um, the practical system choice for all electric medium office, but the modeling capability uh, does not support it yet. Uh, so we are using VAV electric resistance boxes instead of um, heat pump. And it's a more conservative result. So whatever results we are seeing, um, ideally it should be better with heat pump, uh, especially on the energy cost saving side. But the first cost is yet to be evaluated how it impacts uh, for uh, central heat pump boiler versus um, electric resistance boxes. Does that help answer the question? Yes, thank you, Avni. OK, um, so I'll dive into the results. For medium office, the first package we evaluated is just all electric. Uh, this includes uh, HVAC system only. The water heating is already electric resistance uh, point of use. As we can see, it's not cost effective in any climate zone um, on either of the metrics. Um, adding the efficiency measures does help um, on build cost effectiveness uh, for a few climate zones like 4, 6 to 10 and 15. These are some of the milder climate zones with uh, lesser heating load. We also added load flexibility, as I mentioned before, like smart thermostat and demand response lighting. Um, that helped the results considerably. Uh, as we can see, it is on build cost effective for most of the climate zones, and it is TDV cost effective for uh, some of the mild climate zones like 4, 6 to 10, 15, um, with a couple of others being close to being cost effective. For retail, um, it is cost effective um, based on HVAC electrification alone uh, for few of the climate zones uh, on on-bill basis. For on-bill, uh, we have 2, 4 to 9, 12, and 15 being uh, cost effective with electrification alone because of the first cost savings. And we have TDV cost effective for all the climate zones. Uh, Adding the efficiency measures to the electrification package, um, we get cost effective results for almost all the climate zones. Um, on bill approach, we do have a few that are still not cost effective, like 9, 10, and 16. Um, so we may be evaluating if there are any other potential measures um, in the next round. OK, I can take another pause here uh, to see if there are any questions regarding office and retail results.
Avni, you got a question from Tom that asks, are these GHD tons saved just the annual amount or the 30 year amount? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, this is the annual amount that we're showing. I should have mentioned that. Um, thanks for pointing it out. I had a little question. Can you explain a little bit how the smart thermostat contributes to the load flexibility? Yeah. So uh, what we're evaluating as a part of smart thermostat measure is um, I think so the default schedule is 75 degrees, um, but in the peak times like between 4 to 9 p.m. we are uh, increasing that by two degrees and that gives us um, a lot of cost savings. Got it. OK, so you let it float a little bit during that peak time. Yes. OK, thank you. Looks like we have another question from Barry. Will results be updated when CBETCOM supports a central central heat pump HVAC for the office model? Yeah, so um, by CBECCOM, I'm assuming it's um, like you're asking about CBEC. Uh, so we have moved on to CBEC now um, instead of CBECCOM. And um, I think depending on when we get the capability, um, we will definitely um, want to support that. Uh, I think it depends on the timing and um, how reliable it is. We will be doing some testing once it is released. Uh, any idea when that's scheduled for? No, unfortunately okay. not. <laughs> <laughs> it is worth an ask. OK, we have another question from Corey. Were the reduced ventilation and cooling needs of electric cooking included in the restaurant evaluation? Yeah. Um, so it does. Um, it does get accounted in the software automatically. Uh, I don't have the percentage savings, um, but this is not like post processing, so. Um, it's directly coming from the software's uh, algorithm. So I assume that it should be uh, uh, accounting for the ventilation and cooling reductions. Thank you. And Barry has a follow up question about CBEC. Um, I, is the limitation where CBEC doesn't support central heat pumps specific to the 2022 code only? He says uh, folks are pulling permits for such systems under the current code. Yeah, so I think there might be a workaround. I don't think it is specific to 2022. We did not have the capability in our previous um, REACH code study uh, in 2019 as well. Um, and I know that the team is working on adding the capability, but um, it's it's just a software limitation and it's not specific to like a particular code cycle. I'll, I'll add on a little bit here. This is Farhad with TRC. Thanks, Avni. Um, that those permits that are getting approved with a central heat pump, hyd hydronic central heat pump, even though the modeling software can't model it now, typically happens through dedicated conversations between the design engineering team and the building official team. Um, and it's, you know, they, they can be kind of complex and it's a matter of capacity or at the building officials um, table and their, their willingness to be able to accommodate such a system. But it, it's more it's more ad hoc than it is uh, regular. Thank you, Farhan. And we have a question from Christine. Uh, the cost effectiveness results for quick service restaurants are all negative. So does that mean that cities cannot mandate all electric for these building types? Yeah, so I do plan to discuss the restaurant results in more detail, um, but the answer is uh, no and yes. <laughs> um, but we will discuss that in more detail once we enter uh, the restaurant and hotel section. OK, um, but before like overwhelming with the results, I wanted to just like discuss results specific to office and retail. Fabulous. OK. Yeah, and I see a comment about adding uh, units, KWH per year, thumbs per year. Uh, that's that's helpful. Uh, we'll do that for the draft report. I think we've gone through all the questions in the chat. Are there any? It uh, looks like some Bo has his hand up. Bo, go ahead. Thanks. 
Yeah, I'm wondering if you might have some additional scenarios for above code efficiency on the HVAC equipment. I know that would be preempted, but it would be perhaps a good scenario to show that a building can be cost effective, say all electric versus mixed fuel. Uh, you couldn't mandate it, but at least it could show a cost effective uh, scenario that's off that's likely to be used. And then also in the same vein, maybe there could be a scenario with added PV uh, because that could also make it cost effective. And then on the central heat pump HVAC side, I'm, I'm thinking it might be good to have a disclaimer in the report about how that's excluded and, if possible, even try to estimate what that scenario would look like, even though you can't have it in CBEC. Yeah, those are good suggestions. Um, just on the added measures, we uh, will discuss some of our next steps in our last slides, where we talk about adding some of the additional measures, such as additional PV. Um, I think preemption is something that um, the uh, higher efficiency HVAC systems is something that we haven't added in scope. We are still in discussion um, to see if that is required. I think we are trying to first develop packages that um, we can mandate as reach code option without running into preemption issues. But it's a possibility that we can look into. All right. Any other questions on uh, office and retail? Cool. Um, let me dive into the next set of results now. Uh, thank you for all the questions. These are helpful feedback um, and we'll definitely keep that in mind. Um, for the quick service restaurant uh, for all electric code minimum efficiency, this includes electrification of HVAC system, service hot water and cooking. Uh, the, this package with all the three uh, end use being electrified, it is not cost effective in any climate zones because of the electric cooking that increases the utility costs a lot and uh, really affects energy cost savings and hence the cost effectiveness. So the next package we evaluated is we removed the electrification of cooking. So both baseline and proposed has gas cooking. And with that, just electrifying HVAC and water heating, we do get cost effectiveness in most climate zones on TDV basis and on bill cost effectiveness in few of the climate zones. This is um, electrification alone, just HVAC and water heating. We did add some efficiency measures. With that, we do improve the on bill cost effectiveness and it gives us cost effective results for almost all the climate zones as shown here. Again, just to reiterate, so this is uh, this does not include cooking electrification, both baseline and proposed has gas cooking. Um, so to answer, um, Christine, to answer your question, there are uh, packages, there are each code options that can be um, that can be implemented for restaurants. Um, it just means that we have uh, we need some exemptions for cooking. And lastly, for restaurant, we did add a load flexibility measure, which is um, load shift in heat pump water heater, where we are doing preheating and storing the hot water before the peak periods. And that added uh, load flexibility um, improves the cost effectiveness. Um, and that package is cost effective for all the climate zones. Going into the hotel, um, for hotel, we are electrifying the HVAC, water heating, and the clothes dryer. Um, just electrification alone, without any measures, it is TDV cost effective for all the climate zones, but it is not on bill cost effective for most of them. Um, it is somewhat 
closer though. We have P by C ratios on bill between 0.5 to 0.9. Uh, A lot of them are like greater than 0.7. So uh, there is a potential to add measures and make it cost effective. Uh, for climate zone four, though, it is cost effective already uh, just with electrification without any efficiency measures. Adding the efficiency measures to this package, um, we get TDV cost effectiveness for all the climate zones similar to before, but additionally we get on bill cost effectiveness for few more climate zones. Uh, we have 2 to 5, 13 and 15. Um, and some others which are now even more closer to being cost effective. Um, so this is um, the final result. This is the draft results for hotel right now. We do plan to add some extra measures, including load flexibility to help bridge some of the gap um, and bring more climate zones to be cost effective. Um, and I can complete this with the conclusions and next steps. Hopefully some of that will answer um, their questions already, and then we can take up the rest of the questions. So based on the results that we showed today, we can see that electrification alone uh, can be challenging to be cost effective. Uh, the additional efficiency measures do help considerably. And um, in terms of the efficiency measures that are being added to the package, um, we do have fewer opportunities as compared to the 2019 code cycle because um, some of those uh, efficiency improvements are added in the code itself. So we have an improved 2022 code for non-residential buildings, which leaves um, fewer opportunities to add measures. But um, this time we are adding load flexibility measures as well, especially for medium office. We see a considerable difference in cost effectiveness and um, these are free measures. So there is already a requirement for smart thermostat um, or capability of um, DR lighting, but uh, the measure, sorry, but the measure is more in implementation and the kind of schedules to be implemented just to show what the potential um, of savings, cost savings looks like. Um, based on our observation, TDB metric is uh, generally more often cost effective. On bill is harder to be cost effective. Um, many building types. Uh, so the overall conclusion we have is um, for many building types and climate zones, um, we do have cost effective electric uh, pathways. For small hotel um, with the inclusion of central water heating and laundry electrification, um, we have tremendous HVAC cost savings. Um, and for restaurant, the all electric cooking is not yet cost effective as we saw before, but uh, exempting the cooking, we do have uh, cost effective all electric packages for restaurant. Some of the next steps, uh, we plan to look into additional efficiency measures. We will also evaluate additional PV over and above the prescriptive requirements. So currently these packages already include some prescriptive uh, size PV for three out of four prototypes. So the restaurant um, does not have any PV currently because um, there is an exception that applies to the restaurant. Uh, so it's not prescriptively required, but um, we will be evaluating uh, additional PV wherever required. Uh, we do plan to add load flexibility for small hotel clothes drying. Um, this is uh, electric resistance clothes dryer and uh, shifting some of the drying load to off peak times can give us further uh, bill savings. Um, 
we are also refining and finalizing some of our incremental costs, especially uh, the water heating costs in small hotel. Uh, we are still working with our design build contractors and um, coming up with more accurate estimates for the incremental costs. Um, lastly, we uh, we will be reporting on the compliance metrics that Misty talked about in the start of the presentation. We have two main metrics, uh, TDV compliance margin and a new metric called source energy metric. Um, we did evaluate it in our draft results, um, although we have questions and there are some concerns that we are still looking into. And once we resolve our concerns related to what the standard design looks like in the new CBAC 2022 beta version, we will be uh, sharing compliance metrics um, results as well. Um, just to give an example, like a couple of um, differences that we saw in terms of standard design is um, the standard design assumes a basic control for battery. Whereas um, our understanding is that advanced TOU is um, the right control to get maximum benefits. Um, and um, secondly, I think we are also reviewing the system map selection, how uh, CBEC, the new software, um, is incorporating some of the changes in 2022 code. So it's still a beta version um, and it's not a compliance version yet. So the standard design um, is not 100% accurate, but um, we are reviewing that and um, we'll present the results once we have a more accurate standard design and a compliance version of the software. Okay. Um, so I can stop here and start taking questions. Great. Um, I have a question for you, Avni, um, on the restaurant cost effectiveness. Um, in, in the chat, Farhad had mentioned that you did a, a run with um, PV, a, including PV, and you said you're going to do that as well. Do you think that that's going to help us uh, uh, kind of bring that over the line with the cooking included? Yeah, so um, I think we had done this uh, additional PV for uh, the previous reach code study, which was very similar to what we're doing right now. Um, so I think there was a 2019 restaurants reach code study uh, that was published, I think, last year. And um, I think we evaluated PV there. We are still evaluating PV in our current cycle. Um, it is hard to say if we have enough PV to like bridge a huge gap. So if you can see like it's almost around $200,000 um, gap we're talking about to bridge. Um, so I think it may be tricky, but I don't have a clear answer for you yet. Um, if it was a smaller gap, there is more confidence that yeah, PV can just like push it over. Um, but I think the gap is too high to comment on it. And Farhad, feel free to comment based on the previous study. I don't remember the results. I know. Sorry to put you on, on, no, on no. the spot there. I know how that is. <laughs> hey, yeah, this is this is far. I just want to point out also that additional PV on a restaurant um, would likely exacerbate duck curve issues. So it's, it's best that we want to actually include PV plus battery at the same time here. Um, restaurants during their dinner cooking are going to ramp up their electric usage right when the sun's going down. Um, so we want to be mindful of that as well. But yeah, we, we did look at it in the 2019 studies I've mentioned and it, it wasn't quite enough then. Um, it, it wasn't it wasn't enough to guess. Okay. But this time with, with including storage, then that will actually help with the load shifting, right? So we did include storage as well. Sorry, Farhad, go ahead. Uh, yeah, we, we did include storage as well in the 20, 2019 study. Um, the only low shifting measure that we have for the restaurant this go around is a, a hot water load. Um, and this is a good, this is a quick service restaurant, so they don't have dishes. Um, they don't have a huge hot water tank. It's a it's a 120 gallon tank. 
Um, so there is a limited amount of, of load shifting that that tank could actually do. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, so we do have a limited storage, um, but this cycle we are adding an additional tank for the load flexibility measure package um, that will work as like a battery, like a thermal storage. And when you add the efficiency and, and uh, load flexibility, the numbers look a lot better though, right? Yes, There's this a, is yeah. uh, <laughs> much better there. Yeah, this one. So with efficiency alone, we have um, pushed through most of the climate zones and with added load flexibility. So load flexibility in quick service restaurant um, does not have that high a percentage as compared to the medium office load flexibility package. It's a smaller change, but it still helps um, push some of the climate zones that were not cost effective with efficiency measures. Alrighty, great, thanks. We had a question from Kelly. It says, can you confirm the model shows 2022 required PV for non-res? I'm not quite sure I'm getting that. Kelly, can you expand a little bit on that? It's Kelly Linden. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I might not have uh, the details quite right, but I, I did think that commercial now had to have PV starting with 2022. I don't know if it's all these cases or only some of them. So are you asking specifically for restaurant or in general? Well, for all four cases, is some amount of PV now required? And if so, yes. was that included? Yeah, yeah. So we do have uh, the prescriptive amount of PV uh, for three of the four prototypes. The quick service restaurant does not include PV in these current um, packages because um, the way the 2022 requirements are laid out, there is a formula which calculates the PV size. And if that calculated size is less than a certain amount, then you are exempted from that requirement. So quick service restaurant was exempted based on um, the 2022 requirements, but the other three do have PV. So there is PV in both baseline and proposed. It's the same amount. Um, it varies by climate zone though. Um, because the formula and how the requirements are laid out, um, there is some changes based on the climate zones, but there is no incremental PV. So all the results that we are seeing here is just because of electrification with um, assumed prescriptive PV in both baseline and proposed. Great, thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. And just to build off, so the next step would be to add some incremental PV onto our efficiency packages on top of the state prescriptive requirements to try to push over some uh, climate zones to be cost effective. Yes. Yeah, thank you for the clarification. Great. OK, and uh, Barry has his hand up. Barry, why don't you go ahead and ask your question? Put it up for a while. Uh, sure, hi. Um, it's a little bit of repetition of my prior question, but I'm reflecting back on the 2019 non-residential studies and looking at uh, the office and hotel and retail. In the all-electric code minimum scenario, there was a cost-effective all-electric federal code, federal non-preempted federal minimum scenario for each of those. And so I, I would just need to be able to explain to stakeholder I do understand there's a new iteration of the energy code, but I don't understand what would change necessarily to make a minimum code compliance scenario not cost effective uh, in several of the, the presented examples. Yeah. Um, Farhad, uh, just a clarification. Sorry, maybe Barry. Um, are you looking at packages with added PV or is it just all electric code minimum? I'm double checking, but it, like figure 34 from the 2019 study is just labeled all electric federal code minimum. Um, yeah. And I, I just sort of searching for that term through the document as uh, I'm scrolling. So you're more familiar with your tables, of course, but um, I, I can, it seems really different, the, the results you're getting here. This, 
This is far. Oh, uh, this is far. I'll mention a couple things and then Api may have a couple more as well. Um, you'll note that I believe the incremental costs um, say, you know, we're showing here negative costs savings here really for the uh, all electric hotel. They were much higher in our previous study. Um, they are um, lower now. That's a result of two things. One is um, we in, in our previous study, our 2019 study, we took a, a single zone air conditioner and a gas furnace from the baseline model, from the mixed fuel model, and replaced that instead with package terminal heat pumps on the all electric model. Um, and th that is a much lower efficiency and more affordable system. Um, and we instead, this go around, felt that the more comparable system that provides equal amenity would be a single zone heat pump rather than a package terminal heat pump. That's one element. And the other element is our uh, con the, the cost that we receive from our contractors this go around regarding the infrastructure um, are also more detailed and uh, higher than what we had previously assumed. Yeah. How does some of that change because of the change to the base case also? You have less less things to convert. So there are envelope related um, updates, but I think the HVAC system is um, similar for most of these prototypes except for retail. So retail, yes, I think that applies. So we have different system than what we did before. Um, so there are some changes because of that. Um, but yeah, I think for others where the system type is similar, there is some updates in the incremental cost where there is a more accurate representation of infrastructure costs and how uh, in general the market costs have evolved. And previously we were also taking cost estimates from one contractor, but this go round, we are trying to capture more diversity and um, there would be some changes based on that as well. Yeah, I forgot also to mention the central heat pump water heater. Uh, that, that's a big change from our 2019 um, as well, the 2019 study. So we have central heat pump water heater costs um, instead of the unitary heat pump water heaters that we assigned to two guest rooms last go around because of the software capabilities. So there have been a, a few changes. And Misty, I'm not sure I understood your question regarding the base case. Were, did you re, are you referring to the heat pump, the new uh, as being a new prescriptive baseline? No, that's okay. Avni answered it. Yes, and that was oh, what okay. I was referring to. It was the change right. to the baseline, but she answered it. It was only for retail. Yeah. Thank you. And just a final addition there: the TDV multipliers have changed since then as well, um, which can also affect the cost effectiveness especially on TDV basis. Um, so we have just, a, oh, go ahead. We have yeah, I'm just looking at questions. Sorry, go ahead, Misty. <laughs> Sorry about that, Avani. Okay, we have a question from Tom. It's been out there a little bit of a while. Um, are the non-res analysis periods truncated at 15 or 30 years? And the answer is 15, you know, and then the, here's the question, the real question. <laughs> Can a sensitivity run be shown at 30 or 40 years with the CPUC en banc round, uh, gas rate escalation as flow decreases and with cost of conversion to electric included down the road? Yeah, so um, the 30 years or 40 years, like I'm just trying to understand if there is a specific reason why we would want to look at this. I think the 15 years is like a standard CEC methodology um, where we do a 15 years for non-residential and 30 for residential. Um, it's based on like the lifespan um, of the systems being used in these buildings. I'll, I'll just chime in here that the on banc rates, um, that analysis was from my understanding for residential. Um, and you know we're talking. Now, I, I don't know how relevant those would be to non-residential. I will say that the escalation rates that we used, they do extend out to 30 years because they're 2022 TDV escalation rate assumptions um, developed from E3 and that's used in the state code. And those do show higher escalation rates to account for the the uh, gas flow decreases you you cite, Tom. Um, and and at at a rate that's higher than electric rate increases. 
you know, I, I can't speak to how accurate those are or, or you know, uh, how relevant they are. We just felt that that was an appropriate citation to use for our escalation risk. Thank you. And then Christine asks if the C if the cost effectiveness study shows that all electric plus efficiency is more cost effective for all building types. Does that mean local reach codes need to be all electric plus efficiency as opposed to all electric only? Um, you want me to take that one, Avni? <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> OK. Um, if you are only requiring all electric, it actually isn't a modification to the energy code. So there is no requirement for it to be cost effective. So legally speaking, you're not modifying part six if you're only requiring that buildings are all electric. So the answer there would be no. If you do modify the energy code, then yes, you'd have to use the all electric plus efficiency, which actually would be the appropriate time to use the energy code anyway, because that would be requiring a, a, a reach beyond the minimum state requirements. I hope that helps. Did that help, Christine? Um, can you hear me? Yep. Let's see. Yep. So wait, let me just re repeat this uh, because we're in the process of proposing our reach code, um, making those reach code recommendations right now. So if we are not requiring additional efficiency for energy code, we don't need any cost effectiveness studies. Right, because for the legal changing. requirement, because you're not actually modifying the energy code. Um, so your your ordinance would be targeted more towards possibly Cal Green or a municipal code modification. I, I will note, this is Farhad with TRC, that we showed very similar results out of 2019, in our 2019 results where the base yeah. building was, was made electric. It didn't actually at that time, it was not only not a cost effective, mm -hmm. also had trouble complying in many buildings and it's with the energy code. Um, as long as there's a cost effective pathway available for all electric buildings when they can't comply and, and, and they're, they're able to you know, make the decisions for their building, adding efficiency measures, adding PV, whatever they would like to make that uh, building economical, um, you know, that's the, the cities considered that adequate to adopt electrification policies in the during the 2019 cycle. But for the yeah. 22 cycle, is it because the all electric building is already part of the baseline that cities no longer need to go back to the CEC to kind of get the blessings if we uh, if we require that all buildings has to be built to all electric? It's it's that you're not actually modifying the energy code. There's no reach beyond the energy code minimum if you are only requiring that uh, buildings are built with all electric equipment. Okay, that doesn't so require that you exceed the energy code. So since you're not exceeding it, you don't need to go through the CEC process. OK, so if we if so, we would still. I think the only requirement is that it still has to comply. Um, and I think the issue can be like maybe there is compliance penalty. So I think earlier, uh, Farhat, correct me if I'm wrong, for the 2019 study, um, there was some penalty um, because of which we had to add like maybe PV as a part of reach code. But um, the penalties are like yet to be seen. Like if you're just building all electric, what kind of compliance margin do we see? I think we expect less or penalties or like no penalties in um, this go around, especially for retail, because retail already has heat pump baseline, as you mentioned. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll add on. Uh, not every building has a heat pump baseline, even the retail building. There's one particularly large zone that if you put one package unit on it, it, it would exceed a certain threshold of capacity and above that the code doesn't require it to be heat pump anymore. Um, so and, and for the medium office, same thing, you know, those are large package rooftop units with the VAB. That's not a, a, a prescriptive heat pump system in the 2022 code. So there are still gaps in the 2022 non-residential code in terms of having an all electric baseline for non-residential buildings. Definitely. So are there specific okay. building types then that that we still need to 
um, demonstrate the cost effectiveness or you were saying like cloth all building types. We don't need to go to the CEC if we if we if we want to mandate all electric new construction. Yes, I think um, we don't have to go to CAC for just uh, mandating all electric uh, since it does not change the energy cone. Um, and this analysis is just uh, demonstrating that there is a cost effective pathway to meet that requirement, um, which which can support that reach code option. Right, and uh, Barry just uh, dropped a letter from the CEC that I think I suspect might have been written to South San Francisco, um, confirming that a, the health and safety code mandating all electric is not an energy standard and will not require CEC approval. Thank you for putting that in the chat, Barry. Yeah, and alternatively, like they have an option to have increased HVAC efficiency um, to help them reach the compliance with the oil electric. So there are multiple pathways that they can take with oil electric. We are just showing some of the pathways that can be cost effective. Indeed. OK, well, this is a, a really interesting question here from Kelly. Um, I noticed some cases in the table where on bill is cost effective, but TDV isn't, which definitely is different. Uh, why would that be? Can we, can we go to the table? I think it was the medium office that had that situation. Uh, um, this one? Right, as well as the next one, yeah. Yeah, so I think it depends on the usage, um, when the energy is being used. Uh, so if your usage is more off peak hours, like office, you're not consuming in evening as much as maybe in afternoon. So since um, the usage is more off peak, the costs are lesser and it becomes more conducive to becoming on bill cost effective. Um, TDV is a similar metric, but um, it accounts for many more things in addition to just the cost. So there's no clear answer, but um, it all depends on what the energy profile looks like, the energy use profile, uh, because the on bill is based on um, the hour of the day and they change a lot between on peak and off peak. Uh, yeah. Does that help answer the question? Well, I think what I'm hearing is NPV doesn't or TDV, excuse me, it doesn't take into account some of the load shifting. It, it's sort of a pro forma thing that you have to calculate exactly like, you know, it's already defined, whereas on bill you're able to include some of that into it. Um, it's just more enhanced and on bill, I would say. The TDV does incorporate uh, those differences, um, yeah. but it's more enhanced and on bill. I, I guess I think of the TDV as on bill and more. <laughs> Yes, exactly. So that's so why it's, it's weird like, that it's worse. It is a difference. Um, historically, it's always been better. You're absolutely right, Kelly. It is. It has shifted a little bit in this cycle. Right. Okay. And uh, now, you have your hand up. Yeah, sorry, I don't see a chat function. So I thought I would have put it in there. Um, for the T TDV multipliers that we're now on, you mentioned things have changed a bit. And so what is the social cost of carbon that is being used now? Because I know it's been shifting around. Um, so there is a new metric that um, more specifically accounts for it. So TDV has some, um, some inclusion of what the social cost would be. But uh, there is a third metric that we are not presenting here currently since we are still um, evaluating. That's called source energy metric, um, which I think um, enhances the social cost a little bit more. It is about the amount of fossil fuel being burnt at the source level. So I think once we include that, you'll be able to see more enhanced impacts of the social cost. The TDV does incorporate some of it, though. 
yeah, there's not a dollars per ton that it includes. It's more dynamic and based on the amount of emissions that are projected to be released as a sort uh, from the generation sources, and it's a dynamic kind of calculation. OK, that's great. Thank you. OK, and we've posted uh, several presentations from the Energy Commission as well as the, the report that was done on TDV. We've gotten a lot of questions from uh, many people about TDV this cycle. And so we posted several files on the uh, Local Energy Code site on our resources page. If you select the 2022 REACH Code resources, there's uh, a few different files there that may be helpful in answering some questions on TDV. Thank you, Mr. Yu. Yes. I've gotten this question a few times. I figured we might as well post it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. OK, and then um, Bo, you have a question? Yes, thanks, Misty. Uh, so uh, a couple of things. One was I'm wondering if maybe there could be a scenario with a larger battery uh, in order to be able to do some more load shifting. And then sort of unrelated, I'm thinking it might be useful to see the breakdown of energy costs by um, type of usage, so HVAC or water heating, because then it would be more clear exactly where those large cost increases are so that um, it's easier to tell how it might impact different buildings or where you could increase efficiency. And then, yeah, I guess I'll stop there. Those two things. Yeah, so for the battery storage, um, Three of the four prototypes, except for restaurant, already has some battery storage. And um, it does not give a lot of savings and batteries are quite expensive, so it's hard to make battery cost effective in itself. So I think currently the size of battery is not the limitation. We are not even fully charging that battery. Um, in this analysis, depending on how the energy is being used uh, in the day, uh, like the charging hours or discharging hours. Um, so I think it's more on the control that has to be enhanced. Um, and previously we have used something like advanced TOU control. Um, I think that's what I have on the slide. So that um, more accurately um, takes care of the algorithm of when to charge and discharge. Like it will try to incorporate the TOU time periods, like uh, preferably discharging during the peak times and charging during the on, off peak times, uh, things like that. So currently these results, they are all using basic control because we're trying to build a um, package which is um, compliant, which is um, as close to the standard design as possible. But we also highlight this as one of the concern because if we are adding battery and the cost, um, we do want to see a corresponding savings out of it. So these results are not impacted because both baseline and proposed have, um, let's say 50 kilowatt hours battery. So there is no incremental cost being associated here, but there is no additional savings uh, either and even if we add additional battery um, we don't expect to see high savings um, except for restaurant so restaurant has high dinner time loads so that's where we do plan to include um, additional pv and battery uh, to help us get some savings but for buildings like office retail um, which don't have much of the peak time usage. Um, we don't expect to see enough savings in those software, in those prototypes. Does uh, that? I, yeah, go ahead. Farhan. Yeah, I was just going to say those are yeah great, great um, questions and comments. So uh, regarding the utility costs by end use, um, there's uh, interactive effects where uh, you know if you electrify two appliances at once you may jump into a different tier or have a much higher peak demand charge for example um, so isolating those utility costs by themselves sometimes is not representative of the, the sum of all of the measures together but we do look at 
um, the KWH by end use uh, as part of our analysis and try to identify um, and if efficiency measures that would reduce that bulk energy usage by end use um, uh, currently. Right. Thanks. Yeah, that all makes sense. And the demand charge is really important. I didn't think of that. Um, that might be something worth mentioning just in a in a, a discussion uh, that part of the reason the cost is so high is that the demand charge jumps up. Yes, yeah, thanks for adding that. Demand charges plays a considerable role in the utility cost. All righty, it looks like we have one more question from Neil Mini. We'll probably make yes, that sorry. the last one. Last, okay, so just um, thinking a little further ahead of for the three of the four prototypes, not the restaurant, say office buildings, is, is it too far away to, to think about V2G I mean, is that just another battery or is it somehow different if you were to include it in some kind of scenario? Don't know what the state of technology is there really. That's you a, mean the thermal, sorry, go ahead. For a while. Yeah, that, that's a really good question. I am a huge fan of vehicle to, uh, to building, to grid, uh, um, load shifting. I think that this is an emerging area of policy research. You know, for some of these, uh, you'll have to think about uh, if they'll have a parking garage and if the ownership is the same and whether they'll have a control system that is governing both the EV system as well as the building management. Um, we have thought through some of these issues. We have tried to th think about these. Um, it's still, I, the technology is there. I think it's coming, it's coming more and more available on a single family level. And uh, we hope to see it you know, expand as well into non-residential level. I'd love to have an opportunity to park at a restaurant and get a free burger because the restaurant would be able to use my car's battery um, or something like that, or, you know, half off on my burger. Um, but yes, it's, I, you know, th there's, um, we need more research. I totally agree. Okay, thank you. Right, fabulous. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Avni. Really appreciate that. We're going to go ahead and uh, move on to the next uh, end here. We have just about 15 minutes left in the webinar, so I'm going to go ahead and um, wrap things up a little bit. Thank you, Mr. One moment here. All righty. Can you all see my screen okay? Can you see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, yes. great. Thank you. And unfortunately, I still do not have camera, so you're just going to, I'm just a voice in the void. Okay, so just real quickly, um, some of the ordinance options, the different options for structures. We talked a little bit about this. Thank you, Christine, for bringing that up already. Um, but I'm just going to go through some of the, the options that we've identified. Um, just looking at the general process. By now, most of you have probably been directed from your council or board of supervisors to investigate a reach code of some sort, and uh, as you're beginning to move through the process. Of course, this isn't a linear process. It has many tangents and circles and reiterations and things like that. But you're kind of in this place right now where you're beginning to get the technical information and starting to develop what the scope may be. And so um, just a kind of a quick reminder about that. And, um, it's time, so now that you do have it, what do you do with it? <laughs> um, so let's take a look at some possibilities here. Okay, uh, it's a little bit of a busy table, but uh, it's pretty, actually pretty straightforward to work through. Um, we've identified four basic optional structures for ordinances. There's uh, efficiency, electric preferred, electric only, and efficient electric only actually efficient let's say that instead of adding efficiency lap um, but anyways we have these four different basic structures and kind of which mechanisms you would use what the requirements are and some considerations um, an efficiency ordinance you would have to go through the energy code that would be an amendment to the energy code and you'd have to go through the cec process that would be requiring that both mixed fuel designs and all electric designs exceed the minimum energy code requirement. So all new construction has to exceed at the same time. It's pretty simple, preserves choice. 
uh, also provides an option if you wanted to require specific measures, such as say, uh, say you just wanted to require a cool roof or something like that. Um, this efficiency option would be the, the path you would take or something like that. Electric preferred is similar. It also is an amendment to the energy code, but it only requires that mixed fuel buildings exceed the code. All electric buildings would only be required to meet the minimum, the minimum code requirement. So while you still preserve choice with that, that structure, um, it does encourage electric designs. Um, there were several cities that adopted that structure in the last cycle, and we've seen kind of mixed results. Um, it, it looks like, and we don't have good data, we have data from a couple of jurisdictions right now, but it looks like uh, it, it does encourage some, especially more of the production builders, I think, to move towards electric, but uh, some of the custom homes and things like that, we've seen less less movement there. So, um, but that is a, a way to preserve choice and still encourage electric designs. Moving further down the path, there's an electric only requirement that can take one of two forms. There may be others. These are the two we've identified. Uh, the first would be a natural gas moratorium. That would be modifying a a municipal code only, not modifying the building code. Generally, those kinds of um, ordinances are focused on the, the actual infrastructure. Uh, they are not energy conservation ordinances. They are just saying you cannot uh, hook up new gas. Uh, one of the advantages to that structure is that it's not a building code amendment, so you don't have to renew it with the building code cycles. So it is a longer lasting structure. Mm, can be a little bit tricky sometimes, depending. Um, you could also require electric only by modifying the building code, and our recommendation would be to modify CalGreen or possibly a different part. Um, CalGreen is, is a very um, straightforward modification, though, and that would just be simply requiring that all new construction is electric only. Uh, there is no reach over Part 6 with that, so you would not have to modify Part 6, as we were talking about earlier. You could just simply modify Part 11 to make that requirement. That is a building code, however, and does have to be renewed every three years with the, and updated with the building code. OK, and the last one, which is uh, certainly not least, it's actually the most, is efficient electric only designs. And in this case, it would actually be a combination of an electric only ordinance, which you could do either through using jurisdictional authority or CalGreen, plus amending the energy code to require some efficiency. Um, so what you would be saying here e effectively is that all new construction is electric only and has to exceed the minimum state requirement. So this would actually include a reach code and would have to go through the Energy Commission because it is amending the energy code and requiring a reach beyond the minimum. Um, you get the biggest impact here um, with this kind of a structure. It is a bit challenging. You do have to do a, a combination there, but it, uh, like I said, you get the biggest impact. You do have to renew it because there is a building component, um, a building code component, excuse me. Um, but it does it does provide some other benefits by ensuring that um, the envelope and the envelope maintains the the stringency from the last code cycle that we don't lose any any progress that we've made on the efficiency side, um, uh, which can add to uh, resiliency as well as indoor air quality, comfort, all those kinds of things by uh, improving the envelope and keeping that efficiency high. Uh, also results in lower bills. <laughs> so many, many advantages to this structure. Um, like I said, a little bit challenging, but also the biggest reward. OK. And so how would you do this? Um, we are we have a tool called the Cost Effectiveness Explorer. We are working on getting the 2022 structure in place right now and that data. It's set up similarly to, similarly to the table you saw before, depending on the kind of ordinance you'd like to construct. Um, you can customize policy options for your jurisdiction specifically, so the tool allows you to look at results that are just for your city, um, makes it a little bit easier than working your way through the report and pulling results for your city from a whole bunch of different tables. Um, 
highly recommend that you read the report and work through it though so you understand those things. Um, it's definitely, there's a lot of information in these reports and it's very valuable information to help you understand some of the rationale and assumptions. Um, once you do that though, uh, using the tool makes it a lot easier to see what the results are that are specific to you. Um, in addition, you can estimate the GHG emissions reductions and the energy and cost impacts for your jurisdiction. Um, right now we will be including um, a default new construction forecast for um, new construction rates, but it will also allow you to modify that if you have better information about your uh, forecast. It, you can also download model ordinance language, compare impacts of different policy choices, and share an ordinance with your colleagues using the tool. Um, like I said, we are working very hard to get the 2022 data into the tool and available to you as soon as it's available. Um, it's a two parallel, well, there's actually several, but several parallel paths all moving towards the same goal. Um, we're hoping that they all converge at the same time. So, all righty. That does it for me. I want to say thank you very much for making the time to come to the webinar and a uh, special thanks to Avani Goyal for your presentation and for all the hard work you and your team have done. Uh, thanks also to Farhad for your support and all the work you are doing with Avni on that. Uh, appreciate all everybody's time and we will be sending out the materials um, as well as posting the recording in just a few days. Thank you for your time.